Like, white people committed to the idea of white superiority. <laughs> I said, wow, okay. You see, that question is loaded on so many levels. Yeah. You know, when you're so used to something, you're used to being there, you're used to being in charge, you're used to being the majority, you're used to being privileged. Do you know, one of the things that really shocked me in the film mm -hmm. was that the ideas and concepts of racism that yeah. people were holding were so disparate and different. Uh -huh. And if you were to describe what you think racism is today, yeah. what would you say? I'm like you, I'm a thinker, okay? That's why I love you. <laughs> You're a thinker. I'm a thinker, right? And, I, and I, I see racism. If I was to describe it, I would say it's like the wind. Mm. I can't see the wind. The wind is not something that's tangible. I can't hold it in my hand. I can't package it and, you know, fold it up and put it in my bag and stuff like that. But it's, it's there. I can see the result of wind. When racism is attached to one person and not another, the other person can be in denial. My mother always used to say, you have to be twice as good as the white person just to be noticed. Yeah. Just to get in the room. This yeah. is not to compete, this is to get in the room. My mother even still says that to me. <laughs> right? yeah. So you know what I'm saying, yeah. this is like a common theme. I guess we've had like in the UK, the Race Relations Act mm -hmm. in the 60s and the 70s and even the Equalities Act yeah. in 2010. And so why do you think they have been so incapable of ch tackling the problem of racism in this country? because you can't legislate against people's views. Mm. And you can't legislate against stupid. You know, <laughs> you, know you just can't, you can't do that. If you're stupid, you're just stupid. So 10 years on from the experiment, mm -hmm. if done again today, do you think the outcome would be much different? I think the outcome would be worse. Okay. I really do. Because racism evolves. Back in the day, people would be really racist. You could be beaten up walking down the street by some skinheads or something like that just for being black. Right, and it's moved from there now to a situation where people have a license to be able to say whatever they want. Because you've got people in power, positions of power, people like Trump, people like Boris Johnson, who, who, who say things like, you look like a bank robber, and you look like a pillar box. So, you, so now, we've moved from, I think, this is what I think, but I'm just going to walk on and I'm not gonna say that, to I can say that if I want to. I've got a license now to just say what I want. Who has the Windrush scandal ignored? My mom, Jai Gardner. My mom died through the same immigration policies in 1993. Mm -hmm. You know, so this Windrush scandal is not strange because this been happening long before the Windrush scandal. People don't know the real, my real mom. Mm. You know, the real story about my mom. They only hear or read in the media, mm. which it wasn't a truthful story because she was more than that. You know, she was a person. She was somebody's daughter, she was somebody's mum. What's it like for you now to watch that documentary? After so many years, when I watch it, it's like yesterday. Could you tell us a bit about your memories of her? She would always buy some books instead of toys and make sure that every evening before, when I came from school, I always had to do my own work before I even get to go and play outside. And how old were you when, when she left for England? I think I was about eight years old. Mm -hmm. Um, she left me with my great-grandmother and she promised that she'll come back for me. So I was hoping for that day, but that day did not come. She wasn't a violent person, has the press identify her. She always wanted the best for me. And um, at currently, I'm in university. I know that would make my mum proud. And would you still like justice for your mother? I do would like justice and equal rights yeah. because that has been denied. Would the black British experience be any different without church? I think in some ways the church, particularly for our parents, um, who obviously came to this country from Africa or the Caribbean, um, the church provided a place where they could feel at home. Being in a society where you felt that there was an undercurrent or overt racism, where you felt that even different aspects of yourself, whether it's your food or your language, were seen as like other and often rejected. That church was a place where you felt, I'm not abnormal, there's nothing wrong with me, this is just an amazing part of who I am. So in Chewingham, Tracy, she struggles a lot with 
with her faith, which isn't something we talk about in our community. I guess because faith is quite a personal thing and it's often something where faith and culture are very much intertwined. So if you reject your faith, there can be a sense of shame or like you're disappointing people. Do you yourself ever find that it can be difficult discussing contentious issues? Yeah, 100%. I think like if you've come from a Christian background, then there are certain things that are just contentious issues with it doesn't it doesn't have to necessarily even be in your own family it can be with other people in church but the fact that like chewing gum has broached the subject of not just queerness in ronald but like you know the fact that he thinks that tracy is demonically possessed like these things are like blown up for comedic value but they're important conversations that it's good to like have out in the open and that's why i think the show is like a really valuable asset to black british Christian culture. Given that's part of the experience of our culture, it's surprising that's not the case more often. Among the black population, church is becoming an even bigger thing. Like, why do you think that is? Just like our parents and our grandparents had, we also want that place where we feel a sense of home. And I think one thing I've seen within the black church, particularly with issues that all communities face, and but in particular things like knife crime, I'm seeing a lot of black churches really take that on that responsibility themselves and say we're not going to wait for the government or wait for funding that might never come. That these are our boys, these are our sons, and we're going to actually step into the gap. <laughs> Does British TV really represent black people? No, I don't think it does. Um, That's quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to continue? I thought you were just gonna. No, you get, you're gonna no, cut into even it. That. Okay, let's uh, go again. Does British TV really represent black people? No, I don't think it does. And I've been in this industry about 30 years, and I can't see visibly more black people on television than I see, especially behind the scenes. I, I can't see many at all, and um, that's really sad. You know, there's plenty of initiatives. They do all these writers' rooms. They do this. They do, talk about diversity, the MEA, this, that. But none of that, none of that matters. I started off in one of these schemes, and I think just like Mohicans mm -hmm. kind of came from something like that as well. Well, I mean, I think the fact that you're here talking to me says, says an awful lot. But I'm not sure it does help. I think it just ticks boxes. I've seen too many writers' rooms to know that it ticks a lot of boxes. They say, yes, we want more diversity, we want to see a bigger diaspora, we want to see more colour in front and behind the camera. But it doesn't really happen. I think the only people that can make it happen is, is ourselves. In Just Like Mohicans, Shelley's character was so maternal even towards her burglar. Yeah. I feel like that kind of camaraderie is missing amongst black creatives at the moment. And the fact that there's only kind of one go-to black writer or one go-to black director is the cause of that. I think, no, no, I think you're right. It's, the fact is, it's the, still the one-ism. I mean, you only see one black person. So how do you feel like British television could go about representing black people? One of the things that they have to do is just let us be, you know. I think we are talented and we're very creative, you know. We've been in the forefront of all sorts of change and digitalisation and stuff like that, but we never take any credit for it. How it will change is for, you know, the likes of you guys to, you know, take it and run with it, you know, and don't be afraid. Go and make your film. You need to develop your voice and feel strong within your voice. And the best way of doing that is take your smartphone, get your laptop, get a few spars and shoot. White people committed to the idea of white superiority. <laughs> I said, wow, OK. You see, that question is loaded on so many levels. Yeah. You know when you're so used to something, you're used to being there, you're used to being in charge, you're used to being the majority, you're used to being privileged. Do you know one of the things that really shocked me in the film mm -hmm. was that the ideas and concepts of racism that yeah. people were holding were so disparate and different. Uh -huh. And if you were to describe what you think racism is today, yeah. what would you say? I'm like you, I'm a thinker, okay? That's why I love you. <laughs> You're a thinker. I'm a thinker, right? And, I, and I, I see racism. If I was to describe it, I would say it's like the wind. Mm. I can't see the wind. The wind is not something that's tangible. I can't hold it in my hand. I can't package it and, you know, fold it up and put it in my bag and stuff like that. But it's, it's there. I can see the result of wind. When racism is attached to one person and not another, the other person can be in denial. 
My mother always used to say, you have to be twice as good as the white person just to be noticed, yeah. just to get in the room. This yeah. is not to compete. This is to get in the room. My mother even still says that to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know what I'm saying? Yeah. This is like a common theme. I guess we've had like in the UK, the Race Relations Act mm -hmm. in the 60s and the 70s and even the Equalities Act yeah. in 2010. And so why do you think they have been so incapable of ch tackling the problem of racism in this country? Because you can't legislate against people's views. Mm. And you can't legislate against stupid. You know, <laughs> you, know you just can't, you can't do that. It's, if you're stupid, you're just stupid. So 10 years on from the experiment, mm -hmm. if done again today, do you think the outcome would be much different? I think the outcome will be worse. Okay. I really do. Because racism evolves. Back in the day, people would be really racist. You could be beaten up walking down the street by some skinheads or something like that just for being black, right? And it's moved from there now to a situation where people have a license to be able to say whatever they want because you've got people in power, positions of power, people like Trump, people like Boris Johnson, who, who, who say things like, you look like a bank robber and you look like a pillar box. So, you, so now, We've moved from, I think, this is what I think, but I'm just going to walk on and I'm not going to say that, to I can say that if I want to. I've got a license now to just say what I want. Can on-screen stereotypes ever be a force for good? Yeah, of course it can. Well, it depends on what context it comes in. You know, like if you've got a family setting, right? an Indian family or Caribbean family, that stereotype of rice and peas, pakora, you know, pile rice, everybody is cooking and providing for their family. And there's stereotypes in all people with that, you know? And so I think they're good ones. They're positive stereotypes. Nice. I would say like the stereotype of family is also like, it's about family, it's not specifically about them being Indian or where they're from. Yeah, it's, it's just like everyone relates, everyone gets it and that's good because it's a stereotype. Yeah, because it's food, you know, you're sharing <laughs> food. It's food. <laughs> it's food. <laughs> We've all got an uncle or auntie who turns up, eats more than she should, you know, yeah, a brother yeah. that nicks your chicken off your plate. But so, some stereotypes are like other people put on to you. Absolutely. And so like when you're creating comedy, I guess there's a thing about if you're on stage or you're on a set and you're like, this is my character, this is what I'm saying, yeah. you get to be part of creating that stereotype, that like yeah. shared language everyone understands. Well, I think it depends on the crowd. And I think if you're a stand-up comedian and you want to take that crowd down a cultural journey, you might use stereotypes to do so. But you're in control of that and they're buying your ticket. Yeah, I think it's kind of a chance to own who you are. Yeah. Like, because there's a lot of shame attached to certain stereotypes. Absolutely. There's a lot of shame attached to, like, oh, I don't have enough money, or I don't look like this, or like, people like me aren't yeah. supposed to. And if you see someone even, like, fulfilling that stereotype, you're being like, oh, she's angry. I get to be angry. Yeah, I get to be angry. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think that we can learn today from Desmond's? We can learn that don't judge a book by its cover. cover. <laughs> and also, Desmond's put Peckham on the map of saying, look, there's just normal families here. We're doing the right thing. Nobody talks about families like that. The media doesn't cover your everyday family. That doesn't sell. Mm. That doesn't help the media. Yeah, I think Desmond's just brought it back home to say, listen, for those people who are giving us those stereotypes, we're no different from you. We have families that love us. We love them. We work hard. We grow our kids with morals, just as you do. And that's what I'm proud to say I think Desmond's put across.